September of 2012, we left our home port of Seattle on a trip around the world in our Nordhaven 52 Dorona. Hello, this is Jennifer and James Hamilton aboard Nordhaven 52 Dorona in Stornoway, Scotland. Today we're going to diagnose a low engine power problem with our 12 kilowatt generator. Let's go down to the engine room. Okay, here we are down in the engine room of Dorona. And this is the engine under discussion. It's a Northern Lights 12 kilowatt generator. The model number is M843NW3.3. And the technique and the steps that we're going to do to diagnose this low power problem applies to the entire line of Northern Lights generators that are smaller than about 20 kilowatts. So it applies to them all. And in fact, it really does apply to almost any push rod um, internal combustion engine. It would also apply equally well to this auxiliary engine. This is the emergency auxiliary engine on Dorona. It runs the, the hydraulic system and it also is an emergency get home engine if something goes wrong with our main engine. The main engine is a six cylinder John Deere 6068 AFM 75 M2. That's a 266 horsepower engine. If this wonderful beast ever failed, this would be the engine that would take over and get us home. It's oftentimes referred to as a get home engine. The interesting thing or a cool thing about this design is this engine and this engine are in fact almost identical. This is a three cylinder version. This is a four cylinder version, but they're all the same parts, all the same injectors, same water pump, same starters, you name it. So it's super nice that they're both the same. In fact, in this, in this discussion, I may refer to, to the wing engine because it, it's, it's easier to see and, and, um, and just as good to explain because it's exactly the same engine. So what we're looking at here is, first of all, we already have an issue with this engine. Starting about three months ago, we started to see a little bit of oil collecting through here, a light misting. I'm not cleaning it up so you can see it's running down here and running through there and a little bit down below the oil filter as well. What's going on there is the rear main oil seal, that's the seal around the back of the, of the crankshaft right here, is leaking oil. And because of the oil is leaking out of there, it's getting into the bell housing. And then from the bell housing, it's getting ejected out um, using from the, by the generator cooling fan. Unfortunately, it spreads it on the inside of the cover and it really makes a heck of a mess. It's, it's a, I like to have things as clean as absolute possible. So this is super disappointing for me to see this going on. Arguably, it's a little early in this generator's life to have a rear main oil seal problem. I'd like to see upwards of 10,000 hours on that, but um, these things happen. As a workaround for that, as a way of minimizing it until we're able to get parts, I've got the oil filler cap off and it's vented to the atmosphere. The way modern engines work is they normally run just a slight positive pressure in the crankcase and that positive pressure makes the oil leak a little bit worse. And so I'm taking the positive pressure off and running neutral pressure temporarily just so that we can minimize the oil splashing around in here. It's pretty good. Right now it's not leaking much. It's not really bothering me greatly. Um, it's not really getting in the way, but you know, it's something we're going to have to deal with. So when we do order the parts to solve this problem, I'll also order the parts to solve the rear main oil seal problem. So. That's why you see this ugly rag on there. So when did the uh, low engine power problem first show up? Yeah, so the, the low, engine, low engine power problem first showed up about four weeks ago. And it, very suddenly, the engine's running beautifully as it has for a 6,700 hour life. Um, always runs well, always runs the same, never loses power, uh, never smokes, never, never hard to start. It's just, it's been a remarkably good engine. And in fact, I feel almost guilty us using this engine as an example for this video because um, these engines characteristically last uh, 15,000 hours, 20,000 hours. There's lots of stories of people that have had 30,000 on them. And so it's a little, um, it's another case where you, know, you, hate to, you hate to point out a problem on an engine that's, that's, that's always done so well and usually does so well. But this one has developed a little bit of a problem. The bad news is we got to do the work. The good news is, well, we get a chance to um, to solve the problem and and see and, and you know see if we successfully solve them. Probably learn a little bit from it along the way. What's going on here in this particular engine 
is it normally runs at about 10 kilowatts load and our, our control systems keep 10 kilowatts load load on it at the max and during the night about four weeks ago it's nearly stalled and so the so the rpm fell the control system takes the load off the rpm recovers it puts the load back on it nearly stalls again and the reason that's happening is it, it's it's way down on power it's gone from when we went to bed being um, absolutely perfect to during the night sometime when the generator ran it's way down on power and struggling so i adjusted the control system um, down to about seven kilowatts and surprisingly it holds seven kilowatts remarkably well the engine um, still sounds good still runs well no smoke still looks good in every way but suddenly a 12 kilowatt generator has become a, a 7 kilowatt generator so we ran it like that uh, for for um for the run overnight the next day i i decided to have a look at the manual and understand what's going wrong you know we need to figure out what's causing this problem so grabbing them the, the Actually, before you dive into that, yeah, what, yeah, are you, sure. what are you using for a control system? You talked about using the control system to, the, to lower the output required from the generator. You can get commercial systems that do this. We've chosen to write our own software system that, that, that monitors the load on, on the generator and, and sheds load if it starts to go above the limit. And so it's a beautiful thing where instead of having to manage the loads and try not to stall the generator yourself or try not to over, overwhelm the shore power, our load shedding system um, you know shuts off the hot water heater or shuts off the furnace or the or the hvac system just temporarily while we're going through a peak load and what that allows it to do is it makes us feel like we've got you know complete um, almost infinite power and it ensures that the system continue, continues to operate well doesn't stall the en the engine doesn't cause any problems and so as a consequence of having that system I set it to 10 kilowatts, I can just as easily set it to 7 kilowatts. And so that's what we did, and that allows the engine to continue to operate fine and everything goes as it should. So in the um, Northern Lights manual on this engine at the back, as usual, there's a troubleshooting session section, and one of them is lack of engine power. It's a, and first thing you look at on lack of engine power is intake, map, intake re restriction. So First thing we did the next day is we is we took off this box, this which is the air filter, and looked in there, made sure that the there was no obstructions in this intake hose that comes up through here and goes into the intake manifold of the engine. So check for any obstructions. The second item is check is is a check for a primary fuel filter. So once we had checked for any obstructions in there, once we'd checked for an air filter um, filter problem, we nope, absolutely fine. So then we go um, check for primary fuel filter element. Primary fuel filter elements right here. That's a Raycor 500, and the, be the I don't really know. You can check them. But you can see that there is a a gauge on top which shows the amount of vacuum in the system. I didn't even bother to. Sh I mean, I always watch the gauge, and if it was showing if it was showing wrong, I would I would I would change it. But in this case, where you've got a serious engine problem, it's just not worth taking a chance for a thirteen dollar filter. So I just changed the filter. Still running, still running the same, still down on power. Second one I looked at is clogged secondary filter element. Secondary fuel filter is right here. This is the last oil filter on the, on the generator. And on this particular motor, it's easy to change and, um, and easy to get access to. So there's, on our system, there's no way to really to know if this, if this filter is, ha is having some sort of, of an obstruction. I've never seen one have a problem. But again, if you're, if, there's not, if you're not positive, and it could possibly be the cause of the loss of engine problem, it's better to just replace it. So we replaced that, new fuel, new fuel filters. So at this point, we know the air filter's clean. We know the primary fuel filter is, is now clean. We know the secondary fuel filter is clean. Next element, next element in the list is improper type of fuel. We know we have good diesel fuel. All of our other engines are running well. We have excellent filtration systems. So uh, never had a problem, never expect a problem by that measure. Next item on the list is overheated engine. 
it's easy to check for. First of all, the gauges are all registering right. No problem at all with, with, with temperature. Um, we can check the temperature with an infrared heat gun on, on, the, on the, I usually check at the, at the water pump itself. Can you point to the water pump again? Yeah, that's, that's the water pump right, okay, right there. there. Okay. I usually just check to, to check a temperature on, on that item. And okay. just that verifies that the, the coolant temperature gauge and the coolant temperature are matching. Oh, so they're reading right. Yeah. yeah, exactly right. So so now we know we don't have an overheating engine. Next item on the list is improper valve clearance. On this particular engine, the, the spec from the manufacturer is to, ch is to check the valve clearance every thousand hours. It's almost never changes at all. It's, it's so a thousand hours is, 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 is plenty frequently. I do it religiously at a thousand hours. This had, at the time had 640 hours on it. So the chances of there being a valve clearance problem are kind of low. So I look to the next item and it says dirty or faulty um, injection nozzles. Now I'm tempted, I am tempted to change the injection nozzles. These are the injectors themselves. There's the three injectors right there. That's what sprays atomized fuel into the engine to, to ignite and, and that's where the power comes from. If the injectors get clogged, worn, or the spray pattern gets poor or, the, or, the, or it stops spraying and starts to be kind of a coarser spray, it can cause smoking and power problems. So I'm very tempted to change those injectors, especially since there's 6,700 hours on the engine. This one needed new injectors at 8,000 hours. In fact, this wonderful engine, the only, the only part it's ever had of any major substance is injectors changed at 8,000 hours. It's remarkable. So with, with that experience, I'm tempted to go for the injectors, but I just decided, you know, I can change, pardon me, I can adjust the valve so rapidly. And it's, you know, it's always conceivable that a mistake was made in the last valve adjustment. So decided I would check the valves first and then change the injectors. So more or less, I'm returning to the list, um, to the list in order. Checking valve clearance on this engine is really easy. I'm going to use the wing engine as an example just to show um, how that's done. But it's exactly the same on the, on the generator. So what needs to be done on the, on the generator is, is, first of all, the front of the engine has to, be, has to have clearance. Then this cover comes off to expose the crankshaft pulley down below. This is maybe a bad example because it's got a, a power takeoff dri drive on the front of the engine for running the hydraulic oh, that's system. That's what's under the step. That's what's under the step. It's on, the, on over in the gen. It's much easier to do where it's just move the oil, take this cover off, take off this white cover, and then the crankshaft's exposed. And what that allows me to do is to see where top dead center is so, so I can adjust the valves properly at top dead center. The next thing I do is I take off, take off this um, air filter, I unscrew it there, and then there's two fasteners down below, two 13 millimeter fasteners down below, and this air box comes off. Then I take these 10 millimeter bolts out of the valve cover, take these off as well, and lift the valve cover off of the engine. Once the valve cover is off the engine, the, the valves are exposed. I bring it up to top dead center on cylinder number one at, in, and in compression. And for adjusting the valves, I use just a feeler gauge, which is a, a um, a, a measured piece of, of metal and of course I don't have the right one here because I'm oftentimes using it so let me see if I have it I do it's over here so here's an eight thousandths of an inch thickness of metal well, that's pretty narrow yeah. <laughs> it is it is very narrow and so what I'm gonna do is is to adjust the valves is put this in between the valve and the rocker arm and the best way to show that is actually I'll just get, show you a little bit of a diagram that I think makes it easier to, to, easier to understand what's going on. I've got this diagram that I've taken from how cars work. It's kind of a nice diagram because it's very, very simple and, and, and doesn't make things more complicated than they need to be. This is the camshaft here, which is driven by the, by the crankshaft. The camshaft has lobes on it. 
the lobes push up and down on a tappet, which runs a push rod, which runs a rocker arm, and that rocker arm is pushed up and down by the push rod, and it's actuating the valves, opening and closing the valves. Oh, cool, that's a nice picture, that's a nice diagram. The way this works is this drives the valves open at the right time, closes them at the right time, and of course, it's, it's a very precise mechanism, and because of the precision of the mechanism, you have to be careful because the, the valves themselves are held shut by springs, but if this mechanism expands as it will during the heat of operation, it will, it will push the valve open. You do not want the valve pushed open because you would, it would cause loss of power, and it would cause the valve to be burned if you ran that way for a substantial period of time. And so what's, what's done is when the engine's cold, we want to have eight thousandths of an inch clearance between the valve and that rocker. And what that means at eight thousandths of an inch means as this heats up and expands, as this heats up and expands, as the valve heats up quickly and to expand if it's an exhaust valve, there's still gonna be clearance there. And so that spring's still gonna close the valve precisely and completely and make sure the engine's getting um, producing full power and the valve's not damaged by being held partly open. In order Why would having the valve be held partly open damage it? What happens is hot combustion gases that should be driving the piston down are instead pushed out the exhaust port and it, it tends to erode the seat and um, th through overheating it. And the seat of the valve, where is that in this picture? In this picture it's not showing. You can see the valve is is standing alone so you can see it. Yeah. It's actually running up and down in a cylinder head and it's closing off, the, that valve is closing off in a circular seat inside the cylinder head. Okay, okay. So what I'm gonna do is take this feeler gauge, slip it into the gap. Once the engine is in the right position, what, which means the valve lobes are, are turned all the way around and both these valves are closed. I'll do that by setting, by working on the crankshaft side and setting it to top dead center for, for that particular cylinder. And so I know the valves are completely closed. Then I'll adjust, I'll loosen off this lock nut and adjust that screw adjustment that is really adjusting the length of this assembly. As it goes longer, it's, it's the rocker pushes down onto the, onto the valve. And so I'll adjust it so it's just barely dragging the feeler gauge at eight thousandths of an inch and then tighten up the lock nut. Is that hard to know if you've got it right? Like, does it take a lot of experience to, to, to put the feeler gauge in there and really know if is it too tight or too loose? It's not, it's actually, it's actually pretty easy. Uh, the one thing I find a little more difficult on these engines is because the valve springs are so small and so light, you could easily make a mistake and, and actually force the valve open with the feeler gauge when you slip it in. Oh, so you have to use a kind of a gentle touch. You have to use a gentle touch and you're looking for a tiny amount of drag is, is the right amount of tightness. So just a little bit of friction? Right. Yeah, okay. And if you're uncertain, try to put a nine uh, a thousandth of an inch feeler gauge through and it should be too tight. Oh, so it, should, it actually shouldn't fit at all? It, 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 sh it should not fit, it should, it, should it should force the valve open. Okay. And so you kind of feel the right spot. Okay. And so it's easy to check, check like that. And so what I'm gonna do is I'll adjust all, um, all six of these. So there's an intake and exhaust valve on each of the three cylinders. I'll quickly adjust them all. And I can do, I've done it a lot of times. Uh, I've done it on both these engines. I also do it on that engine. And so, it's not a very lengthy job. It's not a very difficult job. I think if you're unfamiliar with it, it requires a little bit of care because if it's adjusted incorrectly, it is, a, you know, clearly that would be a problem that could damage the engine. So you do need to be careful. But other than that, it's not a difficult task. So what I did is I adjusted the valves in this engine at 640, um, at 640 hours since the last valve adjustment. What I found in doing the adjustment is the number three exhaust valve had closed up. Which is number three? Number three is this back cylinder right here. Okay. And so that exhaust valve had closed up. All the rest at 640 hours were, were, were correct. So it's a bit of a concern. In fact, it's, it's, it's a two-way concern. The ex explanations for that valve closing up are, are 
um, there's both there's really two explanations one is there's an internal engine problem which is very unlikely and very bad news the second possibility is I made a mistake which is clearly more likely but also not great news I like to be careful I, I hate to think that I, I misadjusted that valve but the most likely answer is I've misadjusted the valve well, that's definitely better than having a real serious engine problem, even though if your pride is a little bit hurt. <laughs> I can live with it. <laughs> totally can live with it. It's, it's, yes, it's getting the next 6,000 hours of, 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 of good, clean power that I want rather yeah. than my pride. <laughs> I can get that elsewhere. <laughs> yes, 100% right. So we put the engine back in use, and it ran great. Full power output. Everything is 100%. What that does is it confirms that that tight valve was the problem, and for sure that's what's, that's, that's what's going on. So we know it's a problem. We know it's likely a mistake that I made, and, and the engine's running great. What happened is, oh, let me think here. I think, about, I think it was about 39 hours yeah, later. Yeah, it was 39 hours. Yeah, yeah, 39 hours later, suddenly the engine lost power again. Same thing, back to about 7 kilowatts same symptoms same everything what are the odds that I've made the same mistake twice it's it seems unlikely uh, we went in checked all the valves doing the same procedure I just outlined number three exhaust valve is again tight at that point almost guaranteed almost guaranteed that we've got a valve problem so let's discuss what that valve problem what's going on that would cause that the two fault modes um, for a valve train are one causes the valve to get loose and the one other one causes it to get tight. So on the loose side, what happens, and this is more common, in, in if there's wear between the camshaft and the tappet, or if there's wear um, between the rocker and, and the pushrod, or between the tappet and the pushrod, any wear in there causes the valve to get looser and anytime you've heard an old engine that's rattly, yeah, yeah. that clicking noise, yeah. it's a loose valve. It's pretty common. If people don't adjust their valves frequently enough and they're not hydraulically adjustable valves, you'll get that kind of clicking noise. And so, you know, loosening off is, is a little bit more common than tightening up. The failure mode that causes tightening up is the valve itself rises up in the cylinder head and closes the gap between the rocker arm and the valve. And if you look at that valve, it's, you know, how could it possibly rise up in the cylinder head since the seat, the, the, the valve is up against the valve seat? There's two ways that can happen. One is the seat's wearing very badly and the valve's climbing because the seat's wearing away. The second, uh, second probable cause is the valve itself has gotten very hot and is stretching. And so the valve itself is actually getting longer tend to see that with high performance engines, race engines, engines that are run close to the line, really driving hard. This is about the furthest away from a race engine you could ever Definitely. encounter. Yeah. You would be amazed. This is a 1.5 liter engine producing 20 horsepower. So there, it is probably the lowest performance, most reliable, most understressed engine on earth. Certainly Cer of the ones we've ever owned before this boat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Considering my taste in cars, that's, yeah. de that's de definitely true. Yeah. It's definitely true. So unlikely that it's a, a stretched valve. So it's more likely that valve seat is, is, is wearing badly. Very bad news. If it was a stretched valve, the danger is the valve will break and drop into the cylinder and destroy the entire engine. It, mm. It's unsavable at that point. It, it really makes a mess of them. Um, so I would not put it back into service if I thought it was a stretched valve. I think it's probably a, a, a heavily wearing seat. The fact that it happened in 39 hours says that it's a big problem. But we, this is a single generator boat. We put it back into service. Again, going back into service, 100% power, very reliable, no smoke absolutely the same as it was when it was brand new and so you know it's you, you could easily believe that the engine is a hundred percent healthy but we know we've got that valve seat problem and it really comes down to can we get you know 50 hours out of each adjustment and get it to limp along long enough to be able to to get the parts ordered to get that thing solved 
Unfortunately, I think it was 26 hours later. Is that it right? Yeah, it's 27. 27. Yeah. yeah, you are right. You are right. So 27 hours later, that valve is tight again. So what I did then is I I can now I'm I'm uh, I'm about I'm basically at pit stop speed for adjusting <laughs> for adjusting valves. I You're can, getting pretty good at it. <laughs> yeah, I can I can adjust one valve in this engine in about 10 12 minutes really fast. So I adjusted the valve, started the engine up, and you know it's back to full power again. It's back to operating properly. But we know we have such a serious problem that we just we really should not be running this engine any longer because we want it to have a good long life. So what we did is we, 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 shut, we, we got the engine running well, shut it down, it's there for backup. Then we switch over to our main engine. Our main engine has, is because it's a single engine boat, we've configured the main engine to be able to act as a backup generator. It has nine kilowatts of power generation capability. And just like this has auto start on it, we put auto start on the main as well. And what that means is whenever the batteries get down to 50%, the, the main engine will start up, or if the, gen was, if the gen was operational, the gen would start up, run until the batteries are up to 80%, and then it, it shuts back down automatically. It's a wonderful thing because it means that we don't need to, we don't need to worry about when to start the generator, when to shut it off, it all happens automatically. And so it's really no trouble at all to switch over to the main. The impact of using the main is it's a little bit louder than this sweetheart of a generator. It's not, it's not in an enclosure. It's a bigger engine, so it's a little bit louder. Second thing is it's a less, it's less efficient. This is a 266, um, 266 uh, horsepower engine. We're using about 15 horsepower to, in power generation, so it's inefficient to run that way. My estimate, based on fuel consumption numbers, are it's about 15% less efficient than this engine. Um, but other than a little less efficiency and a little bit more noise, everything continues to run exactly as it should on the boat. And if we got struck by lightning and we're, and we're even more unlucky, if this engine were to fail, it would just fail back to the gen. The gen would start up. It would run, it would run charge the battery, same as ever. So we've got good redundancy. Everything's working well. Um, there's, there's no problems. But we we do have a serious problem with this generator and it's going to need work. So what do you think could be causing the valve seat problem? What what could cause that issue? There's a there's a couple couple ways they fail. Um one is they just wear out and there's a couple ways of just wear out. One is it's possible it's just, you know, materials problem, manufacturing issues, um things that, problems of that nature, maybe not properly machined extremely unlikely but you know if you do thousands and thousands and thousands of engines some are awesome and some eh, just a little less awesome maybe that's the case another more likely explanation is on marine engines um, the, the real bugaboo of a marine a wet exhaust marine engine is they get water in the cylinder and it's especially a problem for engines that run rarely and this is like salt water. Cool, salt water, cool right. Water, yeah. yeah, I should probably explain how why that is a problem. So let's have a look at this engine just because it's easier to see and it's exactly the same. The way these engines are cooled is water is brought in from outside, from outside the boat and it's pumped up into this, into, into here and it flows through this which is a combination heat exchanger and exhaust manifold. So this also has the cooling water um, flowing through the heat exchanger and so the, the water from outside the boat cools the engine. Think of this as a radiator on a car and instead of being air to cooling um, coolant solution, uh, um, cooling system, it's water to water. In other words, it takes coolant and transfers the heat to, um, to seawater. Yeah, so it's coolant in the engine and then you're using seawater to cool that coolant. Right. Yeah. You don't want to flow seawater through an engine because it's of course highly corrosive. So it's held, it's, it's in the heat exchanger that that heat exchange happens and the, the waste um, seawater flows out the end of the heat exchanger and down into the exhaust. This is the exhaust elbow right here. And so that's, it's also referred to as a shower head where water, the cooling water flows into the into the exhaust right there 
that is two advantages. One is it's getting the cooling water out of out of the boat. The second thing is it's cooling the exhaust system. And so, uh, you know, it, it, right around here, we'll have 800 degree exhaust at full load. And then down in this area, we'll have, you know, 110 degree, 90 degree, um, exhaust and the reason for that is is that is they've sprayed uh, cooling water in there from outside raw um, seawater so the seawater flows from there with the exhaust into a muffler this is a water lift muffler where the pressure of the exhaust is is building up on the top of the muffler and it forces the water and exhaust up through there and out the side of the boat Oh yeah, you can see it disappearing out into the into the end there. You can. So on this particular one, it's a good example. Stick, if you stay where the camera is, you'll see that there's a a check valve in in the in the exhaust. Oh yeah, yeah, just where the yeah where the clamps are. Yeah. Right, and and that's because in really really rough water, it happened to us in the Gulf of Alaska. It's possible that big waves, boats way leaning over, can drive can drive. Uh, cool, uh, ocean water, seawater, back into the exhaust and possibly get it into the engine. The risk, the risk that, you're, that you're worried about is water being driven back into here. If the, level get, if the level of water gets to here, it will actually pour into the engine and through here and fill it up. And so absolutely the worst thing that can happen to, not the worst thing, but it's way up on the, it's way up there <laughs> really on that list. You really don't want that to happen. <laughs> it's, it's way up there on that list. It can damage an engine very quickly. So the, the thing that we want to do, the most likely thing when we're looking at this number three exhaust leaking is, is, is did water get a, come up into here? And has there ever been water in here? And do we have a problem that's allowing water into here? Because if we do, it's going to repeat. So the first thing I do is, again, I'll use the wing engine as an example. First I thing I do is I take off this exhaust elbow. Is that hard to get off? Not really. You have to drain the coolant off, take this cap off, take those four cap screws out, um, pull this hose off, and then it comes away. What I'm looking for is a couple different things. One is this could be plugged up, and that's one of the things that it's one of the things I should have said when I'm looking for low power is a plugged exhaust. It wasn't on the Northern Lights list, but it is absolutely a cause of low power. So I do want to check for that. What would plug it up? What would it be plugged by? Um, many of these engines run at low load, and they're just not pushed hard enough, and you end up with with exhaust buildup, and so carbon buildup, and and that's one fault mode. Another fault mode is um, this particular piece is a stainless steel piece, but there's also cast iron versions. The cast iron versions, as they rust, can expand and close up oh, inside, and so it can restrict the exhaust. So one of the things that I'm looking for when I've got a low power problem, that's bef before I changed the before I went after the valves, I had this off, saying, "Is this blocking?" Second reason to have it off is. Is there water up here, or has there been water up here? Is there any evidence of water up here? But isn't there water flowing through there? So there'll always be water up there, won't there? If it's been run recently, you'll see water here. What I'm after, is there pooling water, and is there erosion or any damage from water? I see. And what I found is, is the exhaust elbow is very clean, which means that kind of makes sense. We run our engines at, ver at, high, at fairly high loads, and so it makes sense that there'd be no carbon buildup. So not a surprise. However, it's interesting because if there were water in, coming up into here, it would tend to have it, leave it a little cleaner because water um, high in, in the exhaust can cause steam, which is a very good cleaner. Mm -hmm. so, so you kind of worry, not worry, but it's just you note that it's, it's surprisingly clean. Um, when I look into the exhaust system in through here, there's light carbon deposits. It's fluffy. Looks like there's no, for sure, there's no water been in there recently. It doesn't prove there's never been water in there, but it's a, it's a really good likely, proof, uh, likely piece of evidence that we don't have a water issue. Next thing to check is, let's see if, if the exhaust is, is properly designed. Now, the first thing when you do when you check an exhaust is you look at the routing of the exhaust and you look at the manufacturer's specification, which will tell you how far, how far the exhaust can lift at the minimum and at the maximum. 
and just check the vertical distances and make sure that's all as it should be. What you'd like to see on these hoses coming up is a nice steady incline all the way um, out of the boat. This engine slightly, this not engine, this, this install slightly violates on that where it's, it's a very level across here. It's not steadily increasing. It's a little nicer looking to, to be level, but it's not quite as good as, as, as well laid out from a design perspective. However, um, I suspect it's perfectly fine. Doesn't really prove we've got a problem. What, what we'll do to prove we've got a problem is we're going to check to see how much water runs back out of the system and ends up in the, in the muffler. If there's too much water in there, it'll build up and it'll, you know, if it even is up as, as, as low as this or, or, is it, or down here, as the boat rocks and waves, it can splash water up into the engine, which will have a very destructive uh, force and could possibly cause exhaust seat erosion. So what we're going to do is we're going to go around and have a look at the generator's exhaust system and, and we're going to check to see if there's any problems with it. Let's have a look. Okay, this water lift muffler is very similar to the one we just showed you on the other side, but this is the one for the generator. Same design where there's a hose coming down and then there's a hose leaving it. So there's the hose, okay, so that's the hose. hose coming down that's from coming the coming out of the generator? Yeah, that's yeah. out of the generator and this is heading out to, to ex exit the boat itself. Okay. This particular hose on this engine is a one and a half inch, where on the on the the wing engine it's a little bit more horsepower, so it has a two inch uh, exhaust hose. Otherwise, much the same. What's being done is the exhaust gases and water, the, the cooling water, all flow into here, and the exhaust gases are pushing the water and gases up through this. And what you want to find out is, is this muffler big enough for this particular exhaust system installation? And the way I'm going to check that is I'm going to run the engine at light load, which is, has the minimum amount of exhaust, which puts it a worst case situation where the more exhaust there is, the, the, more, the, the more power that it's running at, the higher RPM, the more likely it is to, to not be pushing water thoroughly out of the system. And so I'm running it at relatively light load. In a generator application, it's 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 really um, it, it's basically the same no matter what. It always runs at roughly the same RPM, and so it's actually at a lower RPM at high loads. So what I'm going to do on this on this check is I'm going to run both lo low load and high load. And the, the way I check it is I unscrew these two hose clamps, work this hose free and lift it off when the engine's not running. Then measure down into here and say how deep is the water. So when you shut the engine down, I'm going to measure down to here and say, you know, where's the water level? If it's up here or here, it's a big problem. And it means we found that we found a definite cause of issue. If it's down around here, it means we've got a perfectly designed system that's running well. And what we found is it's down around here on the first test, test where we're running at relatively light load. So I put the pose back on here, tighten it back up, run the engine at, at very high loads, shut it off, let all the water run back into the system, unscrew these two hose clamps again, lift this hose up, and again, I'm measuring to how low in the water, how low in the muffler, pardon me, is, is the water line at rest. And it's right down here. It's within an, a couple inches of the bottom. So, what that tells us is we have a we have a well-designed system, and from an exhaust perspective, there's really no evidence of problems. In a way, it probably wasn't worth doing all these checks, but you don't want to expose new parts to a bad environment if, and and run the risk of having the same problem repeat itself. Is that risky taking off those hoses that like water pour into the boat or could potentially pour into the boat from the hoses if they're full of water? No, I mean, if, 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 if it was a bad design and the water level was up here, then it would spray carbon, carbon and, and, and dirty water all over your, your beautiful clean engine room. So it wouldn't be nice. Um, if it's a well-designed system, taking that hose off is never a problem because the water line's always down below it. Of course, as long as it's not running. Yeah. <laughs> all right, let's come back here. Okay, at this point, 
we've got a very high certainty diagnosis. You never know for sure until the engine's apart, but we don't want to take the engine apart because this is our backup generator right now. The main's the primary, we're using it all the time. The wing's the backup, and so we won't learn if we've, if we've definitely diagnosed this problem correctly until the engine comes apart. But we don't want to take the engine apart until the parts are here. The parts are, are now ordered. We're actually expecting them tomorrow, maybe the next day, um, relatively soon. That, so once we get the parts, we'll open up this engine. Our diagnosis is, bad, is, is, a, is, is a bad exhaust valve seat on number three cylinder. What we're going to be looking for, once we get the cylinder head off of the engine, we're basically taking the engine, the entire top half of the engine off. What we're going to look for are any evidence of water intrusion in that cylinder, which pockmarks, the, the steam causes little marks and, and, and damage in the, in, in the metal. So, and it also means there's no carbon deposit whatsoever. And so if you see that, you know you've got a water intrusion problem. So where where do you where are you gonna take off? What, what part are you gonna take off? Yeah, let's let's look over at this engine, awesome. this wing engine, just because it's, it's it's so much easier to work on. So what we're gonna do is this is this is the engine block right here. Okay. And this is the this is the exhaust manifold and heat exchanger assembly. Mm -hmm. This is the valve cover. Below the valve cover is the is the rocker uh, um, rocker arm assembly and intake manifold. And then below that is the cylinder head. And so everything from here, from here up is coming off. The way I'm gonna do that is I'm going to take off, take off um, this hose right here, drain all the coolant out of the engine. And the coolant drain is right here. That little red hose? That little hose, exactly okay. right. Drain all the coolant out. once. Once the coolant's out, I'm going to take take the um, exhaust elbow off. I'll take this. I'll take this um, um, heat exchanger um, end cap off, and take the heat exchanger end cap off here. And then I'll remove the the entire exhaust and heat exchange exhaust manifold and heat exchanger. Then I'm then I've got just the cylinder head area. I'll work on the fuel system on the other side where I'll take off the, um, the high pressure fuel lines between, here, if, between the high pressure fuel pump and the injectors, the fuel injectors along here. So those high pressure lines come off. Then the return fuel lines, this is the return lines right here. I'll take the return fuel. Can you point to return fuel lines? This is the return fuel line that comes from each injector. So you can see the injectors all the way along here. Oh, okay. And and, and that's heading back to the fuel tank here. The way diesels work is that most of the fuel that gets fed to, through the engine actually ends up returning back to the, to the, pump, to the tanks again. And, and only a small part of it is, is injected into the, into the engine proper. So off comes, off comes those two sets of fuel lines. The, the glow plugs are, are in here. I will take off the electrical connection to the glow plugs is that them just in those little pockets? That's right. That's right. So take take this bar off, which is the electrical connection. Okay. So after the glow plugs, I'll undo the air filter and pull it away, opening up opening up access to the cylinder head uh, uh, assembly. It's probably better to switch back over here because it's easy to see on this engine. So this is where the this is the air filter right here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take off the valve cover. Which, which below here is where the valve adjustments are done. The rocker arms, push rods are, are, are there. Then I'm going to take off the next layer, which is, which is from here to here. That's the cylinder head right there. So this is, the, from here to here is the rocker arm carrier. And it happens to be on this engine design, also the intake manifold. So it's a combination intake manifold, rocker arm, rocker arm carrier. So the rocker shaft, rocker arms, everything comes off. Before taking that off, there's an external oil line that supplies oil to the rocker, to the, to the rocker shaft. Um, that has to come off as well, so that's right there. Then all of the bolts that holds the, the, the rocker arm assembly comes off. So then that's the whole engine above the cylinder head is off. Then we've got the cylinder head, which is from, from right there 
to the top of the cylinder block right there. Oh, you can just see it. Is that a gasket? You just that's the head see? gasket okay. you're looking at right okay. there. Exactly right. So that's the head gasket. So at this point, we're now ready to take the cylinder head off. And so all of these cap screws, most of which are, are um, exposed inside the engine, all of those cap screws come off. And then we're going to lift off the whole top of the engine and take it clear. Once we get that clear, we're going to focus our inspection on number three cylinder. Of course, we'll look at them all, but we're gonna really focus on number three cylinder to make sure it's not excessively clean, like there's been steam in there. Um, we're gonna look at the exhaust, the exhaust manifold passage to make sure it's, it's, there's fluffy bits of carbon in it. It's no evidence of water. If that's what we see, that will confirm our diagnosis that we've, we've had a valve failure or a valve seat failure, almost certainly a valve seat. And that what we're going to do is replace parts necessary to, to get the engine back to 100% operating condition. In this particular case, I've got a, a cylinder head assembly coming and all the gaskets that are needed and everything else. And the moment we get that, um, we'll open this one up, find out if we're right on the diagnosis, and put those new parts in and see, see how it does. I'm dying to see um, if, we're, if we're right on this diagnosis and I'm um, looking forward to seeing this little sweetheart running again. Me as well. Indeed. You can read more about our trip around the world at mvderona.com, including an interactive map showing our track with a live update of our current location.